for joining in this live stream event on the work of Frank Scholte. My name is Jim van Giel, and I'm the curator of public program media, LGBTI heritage. Um, this event is presented within the framework of the Netherlands' first ever Queer History Month, which is an in initiative of IDEA. I want to start by thanking all the speakers for being here tonight and who have agreed to share their views on Frank Scholte. In particular, I want to thank Sari Sananiri for his generous collaboration on this project. Uh, this event has been a very long time in the making. We've been having conversations about it for about a year and a half or close to two years, uh, which has also been this long because of the pandemic which happened in between or is still very much ongoing, I should say. Um, I'm very excited that we've been able to make this event work. Unfortunately, due to travel restrictions, Sari could not be here tonight. So we're having um, a pre-recorded video from Sari instead. This event is sort of split up into two parts, the first being a historical take on Scholte from Theo van der Meer and Sari Zananiri, and the second a contemporary culture, uh, curatorial view from Guinevere Ross, Edwin Nasser, and Vivian Zihau, who are, whom I will introduce later. Uh, first up will be Theo van der Meer. Dr. Theo van der Meer is specialized in the legal and social history of homosexuality. His work covers both the early modern and modern period, including World War II. Van der Meer is biographer of Dr. Uh, Jacob Anton Schorer, the founder of the first homosexual rights organization in the Netherlands, uh, which is subtitled A Biography of Homosexuality. It analyzes the rise of homosexual character in the 20th century Holland. Van der Meer is currently completing the biography of Piet Meertens, founder of the Meertens Institute uh, of, the Royal, of the Dutch Royal Academy of Sciences, and who is the protagonist in the seventh, volu in the seventh volume, Roman and Cliff de Bureau. After Theo van der Meer, we will listen to the pre-recorded talk of Sari Sananiri. Sari Sananiri is an artist and cultural historian. He completed a PhD in fine arts at Monash University in 2014. Um, and sorry, his research interests sit at the intersection of colonialism, indigeneity, religious narrative, and visual culture. He exhibits and curates wildly. Most recent, uh, Frank Scholte Archaeology and Tourism in the Holy Land at Rijksmuseum Oudheide. Um, he is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the NWL-funded project Crossroads European Cultural Diplomacy and Arab Christians in Palestine, 1918-1948. But first, we will listen to Theo van der Meer. Theo. I'm going to give a short talk about Frank Scholten and uh, not particularly about his work as a photographer, as a writer, but uh, f from a period in his life which shows a very different side of his, but on which Sari probably will reflect uh, or will be able to reflect uh, uh, on this period in Scholten's life. Uh, especially as far as his uh, work work uh, is concerned. S Frank Scholte was uh, known as a literary scholar and he came from a very rich Dutch elite family. I first hit upon him when I was doing research in court records in 1910. And his uh, uh, appearance in the court records uh, were related to his life as a very active homosexual. Homosexual behavior had been decriminalized in the Netherlands already in, in 1812. But just in the year 1910, a new minister of justice, as you would say in America, the attorney general, through a series of manipulations, introduced a new law against homosexuality. It was Article 248B, which didn't prohibit homosexuality, homosexual behavior as such, but introduced a new special age of consent for homosexual behavior. Until then, uh, the age of consent in general for all sexual behavior was 16, and then he introduced 
a new age of consent of 21 for uh, homosexual behavior. And at the same time, the age of consent for heterosexual behavior remained 16. This was not meant to protect tender young souls. It was meant to prevent young boys between the ages of 16 and 21 to become homosexuals. According to this Minister of Justice, uh, the uh, 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 homosexual men generally would try to seduce, especially young men between the ages of 16 and 21, which he referred to as a form of Greek pederasty. And he said in Parliament when he defended his new law that he would, uh, that he would hate to have to tell a father that, a son, that his son had become a homosexual through seduction. So a homosexual man, according to him, predated especially upon these youngsters. In and outside parliament, there was a lot of resistance against this law, although according, uh, as a result of the, the, uh, uh, the way uh, uh, the, the parties were represented in parliament, uh, he, uh, most of the, um, uh, an overwhelming majority in Parliament voted in favour of this uh, this law. It so happened that when the debates in Parliament were going on, uh, the, uh, news appeared in the in the, uh, uh, in the newspapers that the police in Amsterdam had arrested. Uh, this, by the way, is this, uh, this minister, uh, uh, this uh, attorney general, who uh, was minister from 1910 to 1913, and he died while he was, uh, was minister, about which many people were quite happy, actually. Um, the, it so happened that in, in 1910, police in Amsterdam, in a part of Amsterdam called the Pipe, had arrested a man named Ado Janus Kakebeen, uh, a very tiny, scruffy, and actually quite dirty old man uh, who uh, ran a, uh, a male brothel. Here is the, is the brothel. Uh, the picture is actually from a different period, but uh, the house is, is still nowadays even looks pretty much the same as it does here. Uh, he had already been arrested, this uh, uh, man Kakebeen, uh, prior to some 10 years earlier for procuring minors for male prostitution. And he had served already a sentence of a, a year. The minister uh, in, in parliament uh, presented a special report on this, uh, this case of, uh, of Kakebeen and of this, uh, this new arrest for the members of parliament to convince them uh, of the necessity of this new law. It showed in particular, he said, that, that uh, uh, homosexuality was spreading, especially in major cities, as a result of uh, homosexuals predating on youngsters. So the uh, police in Amsterdam had been observing this house and the activities of Kakebeen for months. But then uh, in early 1910, they, uh, or in late 1910, they raided his apartment. And uh, not only did they arrest uh, Kakebeen, but they also, uh, uh, well, they didn't arrest him, but brought him to the police uh, precinct, the customers, and a number of the boys who were, uh, were found in the, in the brothel. The police was particularly looking for one man, and, uh, and that was Frank Scholten, because they had already heard and found out that he was not just a customer of Kakebeen, 
but that he was also a tenant of Kakebein. He had rented an apartment or an, a room in the brothel. And he had a specific role in the brothel. He procured boys and young men and uh, for, 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 the, for the brothel. And specifically, he uh, tried to lure conscripts uh, who were also minors to this brothel. To do so, he would travel third class uh, or he would go to Central Station and at times when he knew that uh, trains with conscripts uh, would arrive. And then he would lure some of those conscripts with him to the brothel. Uh, the thing was then that the, usually this was on a Friday afternoon. The boys would work a couple of hours in the brothel, and then they had made enough money to uh, uh, enjoy themselves for the rest of the weekend in the way they preferred. Uh, the police, like I said, was uh, specifically looking for, uh, for Frank Scholten, but uh, he wasn't present in the in in the, in the brothel in, or not in Amsterdam actually at all uh, in uh, when when they raided the the brothel it turned out that he was in Berlin at the time and uh, he uh, was staying with the famous sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld in Berlin who was also the founder of the first homosexual rights organization in the world. Instead of interrogating, so they couldn't interrogate uh, Scholten, but uh, they went to the house of his father and uh, interrogated, uh, er, interrogated him about his son, which caused Scholten to write a furious letter from Berlin to, uh, to the uh, police commissioner in Amsterdam. One of the things he complained about in his letter was that homosexuality was, uh, despite the fact that homosexuality was not a crime in the Netherlands, people who, homosexuals who were blackmailed, didn't dare to go to the police because they were afraid of the consequences if the police would find out that they were uh, homosexuals, even though it uh, their behavior had not been a crime. And he compared that to the police in Berlin. In, in Germany, homosexuality was still a crime, but when you, when you were uh, the, the victim of, of uh, blackmail in Berlin and you would go to the police, the police would actually go after the blackmailers and arrest the blackmailers. And as a homosexual, you didn't suffer any consequences as a result of that. OK, Adrianus Kakebein was put on trial. The other men uh, 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 were not prosecuted because uh, th that new law that, was, was, uh, that Minister Rahu was preparing had not yet passed parliament. So they had not committed a crime by having sex with minors. But uh, Kakebein was uh, sentenced to three years of imprisonment. After he had served his sentence, uh, Scholten remained in touch with him and actually su financially supported uh, uh, Kakebein. Maybe also because, I mean, in, by, in, by all uh, accounts, it could have been that he was, was blackmailed by, uh, by uh, Kakebein. Kakebein was actually a notorious criminal, in, in not just in, way, in the way that he procured uh, minors to, uh, to adult men, but also in, in many other uh, respects, he, he was a criminal. In this period, after uh, his release from prison, he ran two successive new brothels, uh, which uh, uh, Scholten also was a regular. The last one, the last brothel Kakebein owned, was at the Prinsengracht, uh, 
And that brothel was raided in 1920. Uh, in 1920, there were a whole series of homosexual sex scandals in the Netherlands. In at least eight cities, there were a major series uh, of arrests, all related to this Article 248 bis and to prostitution. The customers uh, in 1920 were also pro uh, prosecuted because, indeed, 248 bis had come into effect about 10 years of, uh, before. And one of the people arrested in, uh, in 1920 at the Prinsengracht was Frank Scholten. Uh, and he was to be put on trial as well. There was one major difference with the other people, other customers who had been arrested in, uh, in, in, in uh, Kakebeens Brothel. Uh, all those other people arrested were taken into custody and uh, had to remain in custody until they were put on trial. But probably because of the uh, elite background of Frank Scholten, they let him go and he was to wait, he could wait uh, uh, just at home uh, until uh, he was to be put on trial. Well, he didn't wait, he actually fled to Italy. And uh, from there, he probably traveled to Palestine, where he eventually would produce his, uh, his major uh, work. He was tried in absentia and got two and a half years of imprisonment, but obviously that couldn't be put into effect. Kakebein, by the way, got five years, and he was uh, uh, already uh, 75 years old when he actually came out of prison. It would, by the way, not be his last trial even then. In, when he was 80, he was again arrested uh, uh, just for having sex with, uh, with, with minors. And he uh, uh, still, at the age of 80, had to serve four years in prison, which he did. He eventually lived to be 90 years old. What was so specific about, about uh, uh, not just Scholten, but for many people at the time, was that they had such a preference for uh, soldiers, for conscripts. Uh, the, uh, uh, this sexologist, Hirschfeld, with, which, with whom um, Scholten had been staying in 1910, in a book he published, Homosexuality uh, uh, of Men and Homosexuality of Women, which he published in, <coughs> first in 1930 and uh, reprinted in 1920, he actually gave a whole list of different kind of uniforms that homosexual men preferred. Some would uh, prefer just soldiers, others would prefer sailors. There were people who uh, had a preference for officers, uh, and uh, then there were difference between different kind of officers. And in the Netherlands, especially soldiers, the so-called uh, uh, so hussars, were uh, much preferred among homosexual men. Uh, and probably uh, that was because of the leather seats they had in their pants. Uh, so that was something of fetish for many, many homosexuals. Nowadays, of course, we think of sexual relations uh, or we have an ideal of uh, sexual relations based on equality. But prior to World War II, that was very, very unusual. People didn't find equality particularly erotic. Uh, rather the opposite, people were looking for uh, 
differences and actually eroticized the differences between uh, between uh, uh, between uh, partners. So, as far as heterosexual behavior was concerned, that was of course uh, uh, a matter of biological difference. But in general, both for heterosexuals and homosexuals, uh, the eroticization uh, happened with issues like class with issues like masculinity and femininity. So uh, feminine men would ha actually have a preference for masculine men, in particular soldiers. Race could be uh, 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 eroticized, which uh, was especially the case in the Dutch East Indies. Lots of homosexuals actually moved to the Dutch East Indies and where they had a sexual relationship with people uh, uh, from, uh, or young men, usually from an, uh, an, an, uh, an Indian, uh, Indonesian background. But in particular, the, 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 uh, the uh, major difference that was eroticized was age. And again, this Hirschfeld in his, his book, Homosexuality Among Men and Among Women, uh, gave detailed information uh, based on research among 20,000 homosexuals about their uh, AIDS preferences. And he came to the conclusion that 45% of all men a homosexual man had a preference for boys between the ages of 14 and 20. There were, was another 5% who had a preference for prepubescent boys, and then there were 45% who preferred their own age, and 5% who preferred uh, uh, older uh, uh, men. So Scholte had a preference for uh, men uh, for soldiers, for, uh, but also for boys around 16 or 17 years old. Um, he, uh, especially with the latter, he uh, particularly, uh, especially ordered them to come to his room in, uh, in Karkebeen's uh, brothel. And just to show you how he would eroticize the difference, and especially the class difference, was that he ordered them to come in their workmen's clothes, uh, uh, and not to come in their uh, 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 in their sun, uh, not to come in their Sunday's best. So uh, he kept uh, uh, that preference uh, all the way until at least the 1920s. That is as far as I could follow him. Just to uh, uh, give a final uh, take on um, uh, Scholten and his elite background, in 1932, for some reason and somehow, he had come back to the Netherlands and was arrested by the police in The Hague. He uh, was hurt by the judge because, I mean, he still had not served his sentence that uh, he got in, uh, in 1920. But just after being hurt, he was released and he disappeared from the court records in those days. Thank you. Um, well, thank you everybody for joining us this evening and a, um, a special thank you to um, Jim and Plodda for um, organising this event as well as my um, wonderful co-panellists. Um, so you've probably got a sense of um, the eccentric figure of Frank Scholten uh, and he's a very, um, he's a very funny character uh, to, to try and pin down. Um, so he was born in 1881 and he died in 1942. Uh, and in the aftermath of his legal troubles and prosecution in the Netherlands, he runs away uh, to first to Italy and Greece, where he spends a year in 1920. And then in 1921, he arrives in Palestine and spends about two years. Um, 
he goes with this idea of creating an illustrated Bible. Um, in the end, he wound up publishing two volumes of what was supposed to be a 16-volume set. Uh, and in 1924, when he returns to Europe, he um, produces an exhibition of his photographs called uh, Palestine in Transition. The materials that he leaves behind, um, there's quite a large body. Um, they fall into two main sections. So the first section is photographs that he took himself, um, and there's about 12,000 negatives and 14,000 prints. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of collected materials, uh, which are also um, visual, mostly photographs and prints, but uh, sometimes um, drawings and other things like that. Um, and given that there isn't a lot of textual sources for Sultan in his time in Palestine, uh, either diaries or legal records or anything like that, in some ways the interplay between the materials that he collected and the photographs that he took gives us, um, gives us a bit of an insight into uh, some of his thought processes. Now, before I get into the queer narratives of the collection, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the photographic collection more broadly. Um, so it's very documentary in style. It's very um, relaxed, quite candid. Um, uh, you know, by the 1920s, uh, portable cameras and film were available. And so, you know, from a technological perspective, there's a different ability to take photographs in the region. But when we sort of think about Scholten himself, you know, he has a he has a very particular approach and it is somewhat anthropological. Um, so, you know, to give you a sense of some of the communities that he deals with, and he was very interested in the different communities, um, he deals with Greek Orthodox, Catholic, Melkite, Protestant, Muslim and Jewish Palestinians. He deals with German, Russian, Hungarian, Romanian, Moroccan, Iranian and other Arab Jewish communities. He deals with the British, the French, Germans, Greeks, and Italians in terms of Europeans, as well as Americans, uh, also Egyptians, Sudanese, Indians, Nepalese. And then within these various ethnic and religious identities, we also get a sense of class divide. So he, he shows us um, elites, he shows us working class people, he shows us urban communities as well as rural communities, and, and quite a lot of the, um, the well-known personalities of the day. Uh, the other thing about this period um, of 1921 to 23 is that it's just at the very beginning of the British Mandate period. So, so the Ottoman Empire um, fell during World War I um, and the British and the French had taken over the Levant. Um, and while Sultan is there, the British are officially given the mandate for Palestine by the League of Nations. So it's a period of quite a lot of change and part of that change is also um, Jewish migration. So this period that he's there also coincides with what's known as the third Aliyah, which is the third um, wave of Jewish migration. Um, and this was really where um, the sort of the first Zionist kind of, it was the first organized Zionist movement. The previous waves were quite small. And indeed Jewish communities in Palestine up until this period were quite small. There were roughly about one or 2% of the population. So it is a, it is a moment of quite a lot of flux. Now, there's three sort of lenses that I want to think about um, as we're kind of uh, going through some of this material on Scholten. Um, the first one is Orientalism. Um, and of course, this is quite a well-known phenomenon. We know about these sort of ideas of the lascivious East, um, sort of very sexualized space. Um, and in fact, um, you know, one of the sort of narratives of homosexuality in the West is that it's an oriental vice. Um, but to sort of contextualise that a little bit, you know, I mean, homosexuality had been decriminalised by the Ottomans in 1858. There was quite a lot of, um, quite a body of queer Arab poetry from, you know, classical poetry uh, from people like Abu Nuwas. Um, so in some ways, we need to think about this as a relatively permissive space, um, particularly uh, for a European coming from outside into it. Now, the second uh, lens I want to think about a little bit is biblification, um, which is this idea of highlighting biblical narrative over modernity. And this is quite a big issue in terms of the photography of Palestine. Um, you know, visiting photographers generally from the West were, were predominantly interested in holy sites and, uh, you know, places where um, biblical activities might have played out. 
they weren't really interested in modern Palestine, in bustling cities, in, you know, um, city alleyways or any of this sort of stuff. And so when we look at, you know, um, someone like Scholten, who came with this aim of making an illustrated Bible, um, there is something very unusual about this, um, this body of photographs. And I think as we start to look at it, you know, the, 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 the sort of biblification plays out in a slightly different way, where he's perhaps trying to reconcile sexuality with um, contemporary uh, religious and moral imperatives. Now, the, the third category um, is classicism. Um, and certainly within the collected materials, we see a lot of classical statuary. Um, and, you know, I, I would argue that when we look at some of his photos, there is a sort of a reinterpretation of classicism. But there's also like some really interesting queer subtexts, particularly when we think about Renaissance statuary that was already trying to sort of combine these classical bodies of antiquity with their eroticism with Christian narrative. And, you know, we might think of famous works of art like Michelangelo's David as being within this vein. Now, the three forces of the biblical, classical and oriental, they, they, they sort of intersect in interesting ways in some of this collected material. And, and, and you know, I think this idea of a religious, you know, erotics is a, re is a really interesting one when we start looking at these images as a collection rather than as individual um, pieces. And I think, you know, this starts to raise the question of whether Scholten was indeed trying to justify homosexuality through culture. Um, we know that Scholten was born a Protestant and converts to Catholicism. Um, and, you know, part of this conversion might have been to do with um, Catholic theological um, ideas around sexuality. So, for instance, um, you know, someone like Andrei Raflovich um, argued that, that same-sex desire gave rise to much of Western high culture, making queers ideal for the priesthood. So he starts invoking platonic ideals that, that, that argue that these occasional sexual lapses were sins, but not grievous errors. Um, and I think that this is quite an interesting concept when we start thinking about um, sexuality in the Middle East. Um, but before we get to that, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about Orientalism and biblification in Western cultural production. Uh, and both of these have, you know, quite long histories. Um, and when we're starting to think about some of these sort of erotics, you know, looking at this sort of biblical image of the, um, of the baptism with a, you know, scantily clad um, Jesus and um, John the Baptist, as well as others kind of uh, washing, there is something that, that has a bit of a confluence with some of this bathhouse culture that's going on at the, at the time. And the image on the right, which is not from the Scholten collection, it's um, of the Savoy Turkish Baths in German Street in uh, London, taken around 1901. Now, this was a bit of a notorious institution. Um, people like Christopher Isherwood and W.H. Auden went there. In 1951, uh, Rock Hudson was famously ejected from the premises. And I think, you know, uh, thinking about this sort of the, you know, the sort of the Turkish bathhouse and the erotics of the bathhouse, we definitely see it morphing into something in gay male culture, you know, particularly in the sauna culture and bathhouse culture of today. Now, Palestine obviously had its own queer life at the time. Um, as I mentioned, um, sodomy had been decriminalised by the Ottomans in 1858. Um, and after Scholten left uh, in 1927, the British actually reintroduced anti-sodomy laws and in 1936 banned homosexuality. So um, unlike Scholten's time in the Netherlands, we don't really have legal records to, to sort of get a sense of what was going on in the, um, in the early 1920s. We do have legal records from later on, after 36, mostly the 30s and the 40s. And, um, you know, the, some of those records are quite interesting because we often, firstly, we know that, um, that, 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 that Arabs tended to get prosecuted more than others. Um, the couples that were generally prosecuted were either Arab-Arab couples, Arab-European couples or Arab-Jewish couples. So we know that there's sort of a bit of um, cross-communal sex going on. Um, but it does seem to be Arabs who were predominantly prosecuted. And legal scholars have argued that this might have been a function of British policy um, and uh, 
uh, sort of um, British colonialism. But one way or the other, it's very clear that there was quite a lot of um, same-sex activity going on in, uh, uh, in the time. And, you know, we can infer backwards a little bit. Having said that, there is a bit of a danger in just making assumptions about homosexuality in Palestine. Um, you know, Arab culture is quite homosocial. That is to say um, that, 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 that there is sort of a different la- layer of intimacy between people of the same gender. It's not uncommon even today to see men uh, walking hand in hand. Uh, and that's a sign of like intimacy rather than homosexuality. Um, and then we have other scholars like um, Joseph Masshad, who wrote Desiring Arabs, who, who makes the argument, uh, somewhat controversially, um, that, that homosexuality never existed in the Middle East until colonialism. His argument being that, that homosexuality is a fixed identity. Um, so while there were same-sex activities going on, the idea of gay as we know it today didn't exist. Um, and so this kind of, um, you know, this, this kind of throws up some interesting questions for us, particularly um, given some of the terms um, equivalent to homosexual, like earnings or uranians or inverts, which have since fallen completely out of parlance. Um, and so, you know, this starts to raise some questions about how, how, how we actually regard the collection and how we regard sexuality um, and, you know, perhaps kind of raises a question of do we need to come up with new terminology as part of a decolonization of sexuality? But these ambiguities also play out in, um, in other spaces. Um, so, for instance, the, the biblical figure of David and his uh, deep friendship with Jonathan um, has certainly been um, something that has been used in... Um, in various contexts to justify homosexuality, possibly um, most notably by Oscar Wilde, who used it as part of his defence in his trial. Um, But when we start to look at these kind of images en masse, you know, it does start to raise some of these, some very interesting questions about homosexuality versus homosociality and sort of the the limitations of their cultural reading. it might be interesting for some of you to know that, in fact, homose- after the British r- recriminalisation of homosexuality, it was decriminalised in the West Bank, in the Palestinian West Bank, in 1951, long before it was decriminalised in Britain, which was 1967, and actually before Israel in 1988. Although it has to be said that the um, the British law is still in place in Gaza today. Um. David, as I said, is a figure, he's a figure who turns up quite a lot in Scholten's collected images. And, you know, again, you know, we can make supposition about him trying to justify um, uh, his sexuality through, through, through some of these biblical figures. But it's also quite possible that many of these photos of handsome, ha- handsome men were also sort of justified through through the biblical. So I think there's a sort of a relationship that goes backwards and forwards here. It's not just justifying sexuality through through Christianity, but creating an alibi to be able to explore sexuality through these sort of Christian narratives. Um, this print on the left by um, Haywood Sumner was uh, in the studio, uh, a magazine called The Studio, um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of, it was quite, a, quite well known within the arts and crafts, the British arts and crafts movement. Um, and this is kind of interesting because one of the other uh, sort of uh, queer European figures in Jerusalem in this period is Charles Ashby, who, um, who was part of the arts and crafts movement and a disciple of um, William Morris. Um, and there's a sort of a very interesting sort of, like if we think about the arts and crafts movement, not just as an art movement, but also as a socialist movement, there's some very interesting parallels to what's going on in Palestine at the time. Um, as Kaysal al uh, a, a Palestinian contemporary artist, has, um, has pointed out in a video work he's producing on, um, on Khalil Sakakini. Um, Khalil Sakakini is a, quite a famous um, Palestinian um, figure. He was um, an educator and a, an Arab nationalist, but also involved in... Um, attempts to Arabize the, the Orthodox Church in, in Palestine. Um, you know, he had this friend, Dawood, who's, which is David in uh, uh, Arabic, who, who, also, who, who he had a very sort of deep and intimate relationship with. 
And again, this sort of ambiguity that we see in the relationship of David and Jonathan starts, you know, we can kind of see hints of that in the way that um, that uh, Sakakini uh, uh, related to his uh, his friend. And so sort of thinking about David as a figure, it's it, he's, he's also a figure that kind of cuts across um, these sort of cultural boundaries in quite interesting ways. Um, another sort of found image from um, from the Scholten collection is this one of um, from the the, uh, the copying Bible of David's mighty men, uh, which is um, which is a story from the Book of Samuel. So um, during a war with the Philistines, they were running out of water. So um, so th- uh, David's three best warriors break through the. Um, the, uh, the the Philistines uh, military blockade to to, to, to to get water and return to this cave but knowing what we know of Scholten um, and his time in the Netherlands um, you know this sort of homosocial space of the the cave and this warlike situation within this biblical context you know it gives us a sort of a, a, a another interesting lens for which for, for which to view some of the photos of military men that um, that exist within the photos that he took himself. Um, and I think this also starts to kind of play into some interesting nation building narratives. So, um, I mean, the top center image, for instance, is American sailors um, just outside of Jerusalem. And beneath that is um, French military personnel uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, on the top right, we have um, uh, Zionist laborers, uh, you know, which was very much, I mean, the history, the, uh, the, the, uh, Jewish labor federation was, um, was very sort of instrumental in, in, in organizing the third Aliyah. And beneath that image, we've also got images, uh, an image of, um, some Palestinian scouts. Now the scouts in Palestine had been established, uh, the scout movement had been established in 1912, um, uh, and was uh, very much used by the British in the context of World War I. But by the time we get to the 1930s and the, the Arab revolts, the scout movement is actually battling against the, um, the British. And so what we start to see is, is not just a, justifi- a justification of sexuality through religion, but, but an eroticization of nation building through the men that were involved in it, which I think is... Um, is a sort of a really interesting lens for thinking about the way Scholten deals with with modernity in Palestine in many ways. It's not, it's you know, homosexuality becomes something that becomes threaded through other uh, many other narratives. And when we start thinking back to Scholten's time in um, in the Netherlands, for which we have um, at least a few more legal records, I, I mean, we know that um, from 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 Theo's work, we know that. Um, that Scholten would pick up men at Amsterdam Central or um, would travel in third class um, on the train to, to, to pick up uh, military men. So starting to draw some of these inferences from the Netherlands, um, given that we don't have a lot of textual evidence of Scholten's personal life in Palestine, we really start to, um, you know, we really start to, you know, have a series of questions which really, um, you know, need a lot more study. And I suppose one of them is how do we deal with sexuality from from a transnational perspective, but also how do we think about the impacts of modernity and homosexuality within that, uh, within a sort of a more geopolitical context. I thought I'd finish up on this um, rather fantastic image, uh, which is annotated Swedish sailors. It's taken about 1918, 1919, so just before um, before Scholten, um leaves the Netherlands for um, for the Mediterranean. But I think, um, you know, it's such a wonderful image with this, uh, this sailor turned back towards us, quite conscious of the camera, but also the series of glances by the men who are passing by them. And I think, uh, I think it's a, a really nice note to sort of end on, but also one that perhaps, you know, helps to contextualise some of the photos that are in Palestine as well. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Are we good? All right. Um, As mentioned before, this event is loosely split up in two parts. We just finished the first part in which we looked at uh, the historical narrative of Scholte and were better introduced to his work and um, 
also have heard how we can start unpacking this work and which different themes lie within it and um, also lie within the persona of Scholte and the lens in which he shoots his images. Um, now we will look at how these images can be shown uh, because they are not completely unproblematic as we've also just seen and how these can be shown in institutions. Um, we have three speakers who will speak back to back. I will introduce them all three to you now. First up, we will have Guinevere Ross. Uh, she graduated in 2018 with a bachelor's from the Rijnwaard Academy. In her thesis, she researched the narrative representation of heritage of Curaçao in the Tropen Museum. As an outcome, she developed a guide for museum employees to implement multivocality. She currently works as a curator at the Netherlands Photo Museum in Rotterdam, and she previously made exhibitions for the Dutch National Museum of World Cultures. In between jobs, Guinevere gives lectures, workshops, and advice to museums that struggle with questions of inclusion. She specializes in the facilitation of inclusion by means of multifocality. To achieve this, she is actively committed to breaking stereotypes by improving the representation of marginalized groups in the museum space. After that, we have Edwin Nasser, who is a writer and cultural practitioner based between Amsterdam and Beirut. He is currently completing the 2020-2021 curatorial program at the Apple. Nasser is the assistant to the director at Ashkal Alwan, a non-profit organization based in Beirut uh, and committed to contemporary artistic practice and research, where he takes part in the curatorial developments of public programs and publishing platforms. He writes regularly on cultural production and political uh, mobilizations in the Arab region. And um, in closing, we will have Vivian Z. Hurl, who's a uh, critic, curator, and researcher of contemporary art. Raised in Australia and working in the Netherlands, she currently is a uh, research and program manager at Kunstinstitut Meli. From 2016 until 2019, she was the founder and director of art and research foundation Frontier uh, Imaginaries that staged internationally mobile thematic editions through exhibitions, art commissions, and symposium projects. In 2017, she co-convened Humans of the Institution with Anne Selfer Carlson, a project dedicated to mobilize, mobilizing international action on the conditions of the freelancer, presented together with the University of Bergen, Fame has for Performance, Amsterdam Art Weekend, and Dutch Art Institute. She was curator of Jerusalem Show 8 in 2016 with the Al Mamal Foundation. From 2012 to 2014, she was curator with performance-based institution, If I Can Dance, I Don't Want to Be Part of Your Revolution. And in 2013 and 2012, she was guest curator of Stage It, which launched, a, which launched the performance program at the Stedelijk Museum upon its reopening. C. Uh, Hurl sorry, is a PhD candidate in curatorial practice at Monash University in Melbourne. But first up, Gwen Affair, thank you. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Um, and um, yeah, so Frank Scholte, a Dutch homosexual elite, Catholic convert. You can't say that his legacy as a, as a photo photographer suddenly was captured through one of these identity lenses. It touches gender, race, class, and religion. Uh, Scholten's photo photogra photographic collection shows us a world in which British colonial rule brought new populations into the already diverse post-Ottoman context. Um, his picture shows us British soldiers, uh, French and American troops. And uh, to talk more about the context and the anti-Semitism in the early 1920s, um, there's, there's just a lot going on. Um, and uh, as earlier stated by Sari, uh, imagery of uh, where biblification relies on the interpretation of the image through a process of familiarization. Ori Orientalism is a system that relies on the demarketing, demarketing otherness by the positioning of the Orient and inhabitants against the modernity. In, um, so when you look at um, the consumers, like the, the Western, uh, Western market, um, Sorry, 
Um, so vilification and Orientalism were used to glorify and improve the imagery of the Western civilization and hence colonial power dynamics. In Scholten's collection, the collection of photographies, of photography, homoeroticism undermines this, like there's a tension in classicism, vilification, Orientalism, and modernity. Um, as a curator uh, with a focus on multifocality and social injustice, I would like to underline the importance of uh, narrativity and agency and reflect on that just a little. Like, when we talk about narrativity, the most common definition of the narrative correspondent to a written or spoken story that consists of a set of connected events. The purpose of storytelling is to get a grip on what goes on in our head, as well as to structure the world around us. Narratives, therefore, play a crucial role in human perception and cognition. Creating a story, or also narrative, is a fundamentally human construct in which a process of exclusion and editing is necessary. After all, you cannot present the full story without making a selection and thus disregarding fragments. I often compare this with the, um, I lost my sentence. I often compare this with the phenomenon by quoting a quote from the British writer, um, B.S. Johnson. Life does not tell stories, life is chaotic. Chaotic, chaotic, fluid, and random. It leaves myriads of untidied writers can extract a story from life only by strict close selection, and this means falsification. So actually telling stories is telling lies. You always have to make, an, uh, make a selection and exclude uh, some parts. In the context of a curator, it's therefore, it's therefore necessary to consciously deal with the selections and the fact that no complete story can be told. But then again, whose stories are being represented? Um, heritage is inextricably linked to the identity formation, so the meaning of value of heritage lies in the contribution in it makes to the development of a particular uh, identity. As a museum or other affiliated institution, you have a certain authority, authority, authority I'm sorry, it's been a while since I <laughs> talked English, so bear with me. Authoritarian power to talk about stories from and about cultures. But by telling one story for years, you can create an instant, institutionalized truth with which you influence the visitor. If this one-sided described history is a source from which you draw your information and create museum uh, products. You're basically making products that are excluding and most of the times colonial or Eurocentric or Christian. Ensuring identification in art institutions is one of the crucial components for achieving social inclusion or inclusivity in museums. The representation of the cultural heritage of the marginalized communities can ensure inclusiveness. Um, in my opinion, it's time to give back by letting, letting them, the marginalized community, create a narrative and give a voice to the marginalized. So we can change society's narratives and uh, like the eroticizing um, gaze, um, the colonial gaze, and turn them into layered representations. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Edwin. Uh, Jim, Sari, thank you so much for convening us today. Um, I was not familiar with Frank uh, Scholten's work, and I'm sorry for butchering his name. And it came as a quite a challenging proposition to engage with his photographs. Um, as a self-identifying queer individual, born, raised, and operating within um, the Arab region. I thought I'd highlight a um, section from, from Saris um, that I'd like to start, that, that I'd like to use as a sort of point of departure, uh, in which Saris says, the time that Scholten spent in Palestine can be seen as a period of post-Ottoman entrenchment of the British. 
very much a world that was undergoing radical shifts and changes in relation to demography, administration, and culture, but also one in which Ottoman imperial mobility across the Eastern Mediterranean was changing to a globalized framework of British colonial mobility. In many ways, um, and here I, it's a, uh, these queer subtexts uphold Scholten's gestures towards modernity. This taken with intellectual milieu in which Scholten mixed the influence of scholarly methodologies and the new theories of sexuality he was exposed to, we can begin to understand the complexity of Scholten's project in Palestine. I thought I'd bring in three different um, contemporary works um, that have approached um, the coloniality of power through a lens of gender and sexuality that I think would, would sort of perhaps engage with, complete, but also, but also even challenge uh, these claims. I think that um, if I were ever to think through how to present Scholten's work um, to a wider public, it would be def necess definitely necessary to sort of think through a discursive field from which we can begin to understand and unpack this work. Uh, I start with Edward Said, who in Culture and Imperialism um, brings in a work by French author André Gide called The Immoralist. Uh, the Immoralist is a confessional account of a man seeking the truth of his own nature. The story's protagonist, Michel, knows nothing about love when he marries uh, a woman, Marceline, out of duty to his father. On the couple's honeymoon to Tunisia, Michel becomes very ill, and during his recovery, he meets a young Arab boy whose radiant health and beauty captivate him. An, awaken an awakening for him, both sexually and morally, Michel discovers a new freedom in seeking to live according to his own desires. Now, Said begins chapter three of Culture uh, and Imperialism with a discussion of André Gide's novel. In Said's opinion, Gide's narrative is one of uh, transitory and highly provisional self-discovery. Said says his purpose is to sketch the interesting experience that links imperializers with the imperialized. Um, he does add that, and I quote, why the Orient seems still to suggest not only fecundity but sexual promise and threat is not the province of my analysis here, alas, despite its frequently noted appearance. Um, alas, indeed, though we've had several scholars who've taken up on uh, site scholarship in order to think through these questions from a gendered or from a gender's perspective. Um, they include Joseph Boone, who wrote um, The Homoerotics of Orientalism, and which seems to directly sort of pick up from Said's assertion um, in regards to Gide's novel. Um, Boone's introductory paragraph reads, and I quote, perhaps nowhere else are the sexual politics of colonial narratives so explicitly thematized as in those voyages to the Near East recorded or imagined by Western men. Since the time of the prophet, one of these records proclaims, fabulous Araby has reeked of aphrodisiac excitement. With various shades of prurience and sophistication, similar sentiments echo throughout the writings of novelists, poets, poets journalists, travel writers, sociologists, and ethnographers whose pursuit of Eros has brought them, in Rana Kabbani's phrase, to the Orient on the flying carpet of Orientalism. For such men, the geopolitical realities of the Arabic Orient become a psychic screen on which to project fantasies of illicit sexuality and unbridled excess, including, as Malik Alula has observed, visions of generalized perversion and, again, as Edward Said puts it, sexual experience unobtainable in Europe, that is, a different type of sexuality. This appropriation of the so-called East in order to project onto it an otherness that mirrors Western psychosexual needs only confirms the phenomenon that Said calls Orientalism in his book of that name. And to that, I would like to also add um, Robert, Robert Aldrich's, um, whom I've lost. Sorry, one second. Ah. I've included Robert uh, Aldrich to this instead of someone like Joseph Massad, whom Sari had also uh, sort of uh, uh, nodded towards, because I think uh, there's been a lot of recent controversies regarding uh, Massad's scholarship, and I think uh, I don't know just how generative 
engaging with his work can be in the context of Scholten, because I think that beyond wanting to question or decolonize notions of sexuality within the Arab region, I think that the immediacy of what captures me in regards to Scholten's work is his own relationship to uh, his subjects, which I think is a bit more complicated than, than one in which we can sort of identify a Western man um, eroticizing the other because a lot of his a lot of his subjects were actually military men um, British soldiers also um, so I think we can think of we can think of Palestine as a site in which the coloniality of power was operating more so than of a Western man projecting um, a libidinal slash colonial uh, investment into his his subject that he he would therefore also other. But I think that he does sort of follow through with this paradigm of Western men that have sort of sought um, sexual difference in the Orient that I think Robert Aldrich captures very well. Um, and, I, and I highlight a passage in which he says, um, indeed, in French slang, faire passer son brevet colonial, literally, to give someone an examination for a colonial diploma, meant to initiate him to sodomy. Europeans fantasized about vice in the Islamic world, and writers from Gustave Flaubert to Paul Bowles were seduced by the Hammam, the Kasbah, and the desert. Officials worried about sodomy in France's disciplinary uh, battalions in North Africa and the Foreign Legion, just as the British expressed concern about homosexual behavior in penal colonies in Australia. Sydney in the mid-1800s was called the Sodom of the South Seas. A homosexual scandal bracked the, Netherland, the Netherlands East Indies in the 30s, and another scandal was hushed up in British Malaya. Islands such as Bali attracted homosexual writers and painters throughout the colonial uh, era. Some homosexuals chose expatriation to escape the climates of Europe, moved because of political and cultural convictions, or were forced by circumstances to flee. And here, Aldrich brings up a, a sort of figure that, um, that, that, we might, that we might also um, form a rapprochement with in regards to uh, to Skolden, which, which is Dutch author Jacob, Jacob de Haan, who was the son of a rabbi and who moved to British mandated Palestine after the First World War to teach law and work as a journalist. And in one of his poems, he asks himself if he visits the Wailing Wall for God or for the Arab boys. Uh, his involvement with both Arabs and Orthodox Jews made him critical of Zionist positions, and he was later um, murdered by what Aldrich um, says were um, radical Zionist terrorists. Um, one of those implicated ended up being a future president of Israel. Although um, Aldrich points that Zionists had then spread the rumor that Arabs killed him because of his sexual relations with Arab boys, which brings me to my second point. Um, I believe a contemporary engagement with um, Skolden's work cannot go um, without engaging also directly with the contemporaneous issues we face in regards to gender and sexuality in occupied Palestine. And which is where I bring in the, the notion of pinkwashing, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but which I would like to, to continue stressing on. And to sort of unpack in, um, in the words of the Palestinian organization that has actually coined the term in the mid-2000s, Al-Qaus for Sexual and Gender Diversity in Palestinian Society, um, which is a civil society organization that is structured around grassroots activism and that is aiming to be at the forefront of Palestinian cultural and social change. Now, very recently, Al-Qaus released a newsletter um, titled Beyond Propaganda, Pinkwashing as Colonial Violence, in which they were trying to sort of bring in an update on their, uh, uh, on their, on their notion of pinkwashing, which they thought was getting a bit, um, a bit in, it, in itself also whitewashed in a sense. Um, the letter goes, and I quote, over a decade ago, Palestinian activists adopted the term pinkwashing to describe how the Israeli state and its supporters used the language of gay and trans rights to direct international attention away from the oppression of Palestinians. Israeli travel guides and promotional videos advertise Tel Aviv beaches as a gay-friendly getaway destination and hide the reality that tourist partygoers are dancing atop the ruins of ethnically cleansed Palestinian villages. The open inclusion of gay officers in the Israeli occupation army is used as proof of liberal forward-mindedness, but for Palestinians, the sexuality of the soldier at a checkpoint makes little difference. They all wield the same guns, wear the same boots, and maintain the same colonial regime. 
now what El Kaus is proposing is for us to engage with pinkwashing um, not as a framework in and of itself, but as a symptom of settler colonialism as a root sickness. Um, and they say, recognizing pinkwashing as colonial violence can help us understand how Israel divides, oppresses, and erases Palestinians on the basis of gender and sexuality. Israeli settler colonialism works by breaking apart and eliminating Palestinian communities, whether through the military violence of occupation and siege, the legal regimes of apartheid, or the denial of refugees' rights of return. Yet it also divides Palestinians internally and psychologically in the personal realms of self-perception and collective identification. In order to understand the nature of this struggle, we also have to understand ourselves and how colonization impacts our inner lives. Now, pinkwashing pushes the racist idea that sexual and gender diversity are unnatural and foreign to Palestinian society. When this idea is internalized within Palestinian communities, it alienates queer and gender non-conforming Palestinians and isolates them as a social group. These compounding social pressures tell queer Palestinians that they must give up on some part of their identity or experience. We can either be queer and not accepted as a Palestinian, or we can be Palestinian and not accepted as queer. I think that sort of um, paradigm can also extend itself to a lot of parts of the Arab region. Thus, my sort of finding it quite difficult to imagine how framing um, an archival presentation of Skolden's work could even begin to um, make sense, uh, say, if it were to occur in Beirut. Um, I think there's been a long struggle within cultural um, institutions in Lebanon or Palestine, or more broadly, more broadly in the Arab region, to begin unpacking how to program work or how to commission work or produce discourse around gender and sexuality. I think, for now, there are still facile discourses that I think uh, are, um, still need to either be done with or unpacked. I'm not sure uh, I'll be proposing a way out of it. But I do think that um, before we take part in these, in the reproduction of these facile discourses, it is good to sort of, um, I think it would be definitely beneficial to sort of sit back and, uh, and um, conceive of a discursive space for these, for, um, f for any type of cultural production centered around gender and sexuality in or around or about the region to, to begin presenting itself. Thank you. So, uh, I'm here, and I'm queer, and I'm going to be talking about the settler colony, um, which is the means that I have to approach this material. I think I also find it very challenging um, uh, on its enormous multivalence, but also its um, uh, enormous ambivalence. Uh, and I think I'm still very much um, taking in uh, the very dense, uh, meticulously researched material that was offered to us at the beginning by, by Theo, and also trying to mentally comprehend what it means to have this enormously richly detailed material on, on the Dutch side, and, and to not have that on, on the side of the, the photographs that we're looking at, the, uh, the, the biographic information that, that would surround that, uh, and the problems and the fitfalls of, of not being able to project that information across, but a much bigger uh, dynamic of um, narratable uh, subjects, which is sort of what I've loosely called this uh, talk. And I think it sits very much in between um, the two other presentations this evening. Um, and what I'm really, in, in the most basic uh, way, uh, doing is to sing the praises of meeting this material prior to its fitting into any kind of disciplinary silo. Uh, so we're here in a queer space addressing it, but of course uh, Sari approaches it also from uh, 
a space of, of Palestine studies. Theo uh, sees it from a, a Dutch historical perspective. And in the most um, uh, basic form, what I'm arguing for is, is the necessity of that discomforting ambivalence, particularly from the point of view of the contemporary situation and the specific narrative violence of erasure that is occasioned by um, the settler colony as a form. Um, and so I'm uh, simply also uh, uh, providing or, or offering some further um, contextual background uh, by which to begin to further narrate that um, material also from the context of, of Palestine. Um, of Jerusalem in particular, and through some materials that I'm able to share from a previous project that was the eighth edition of the Jerusalem show, and that took place as part of Frontier Imaginaries, which was a foundation that I established and ran uh, for a number of years, focused on the formation of the frontier as a way of um, charting and re-narrating um, the shaping forces of a European uh, global modernity. So uh, the exhibition was called Before and After Origins, and it came about on the invitation of the Al Mamel Foundation, as well as the Columbia International, and in particular to respond to um, the prompt of a, of a uh, exhibition on the topic of return. Uh, given through uh, a quote from Mahmoud Dawish, The Sea is Mine. So the exhibition that I uh, developed, uh, very much in dialogue with the host institutions, with local artists, and with uh, community members, was called Before and After Origins. Uh, it was staged in two parts, and it had the very simple gambit uh, of asking um, if 1948 uh, is the origins of the Palestinian National Project, as we know it, then what is the before and the after? So the exhibition, as I said, was in two parts. Within the before, um, it sort of excavated a, an, an, archaeology, an archaeology, but also like a, um, an archaeological imaginary that tends to get projected onto the city, um, and materials that contest uh, exactly the kind of biblical imaginary that, that Sari introduced in his talk. Uh, so an example was the, um, uh, the talisman collection of the late Ottoman Jerusalemite uh, Tofik Kanan. Today it's in the care of the Brzezit University Museum, which is a bit north of Ramallah in the West Bank, and the collection cannot itself travel to Jerusalem. So it was instead presented through uh, the assembled writings of Kanan, uh, encompassing scholarly texts as well as political pamphlets written during the mandate period. And what you see in this image are uh, rocks, twigs, and other items that are stitched to a very aged piece of cardboard. Uh, and one of the things that these amulets, uh, and particularly this component of it, evidences very richly is not only a cross-confessional complexity, within Palestinian village culture at the turn of the century, but also what Beth Pavanelli would call a geontological uh, dimension. So the types of sticks and rocks that are collected um, relate also to Canaan's notable uh, writing on uh, water sprites, um, which is to say there is what Yellow Knives Diné scholar Glenn Schwann Coulthard would call a, a grounded normativity that exists beyond uh, biblical matters. There was also within the exhibition a curated survey of um, Bethlehem Mother of Pearl engraving from the collection of George Al Amma, which shed light on the impact of economic and political forces upon Christian iconic imagery. So through examples referencing styles from the 17th to the 20th century, the image forms could be witnessed as shifting through commercial circulations, um, and uh, through an industry that produced a Palestinian merchant diaspora as far afield as Latin America and the Philippines, and that was able to source Mother of Pearl from the waters north of Queensland, Australia. Uh, one of the show's largest new commissions in the exhibition before, which was largely hosted at the Al Mamel Foundation, was Comparative Monument Shalal by Australian artist Tom Nicholson.
which assembles a allegory of the overlapping and incommensurable horizons of sovereignty that tend to characterize the settler formation. And through this work, I, I hope to really illustrate this point of what I mean by um, erasures, of narrative, er, erasures of narrativity and the struggle of narratable subjects. So what you see here is um, a sixth century, uh, or a replica, sorry, of a sixth century Byzantine mosaic which was fabricated in collaboration with the Mosaic Center in Jericho, positioned into small uh, square fragments, each featuring uh, uh, one of an enchanted bestiary of figures, such as a tiger or a peacock and the like. The mosaics are partial, with some areas missing, and that cites two large scars that were born upon the original mosaic when Ottoman soldiers dug trenches into them in the, in the um, desert in the First World War. So the original mosaic also can no longer return itself to Palestine because it has been cemented into the central floor of the Australian War Memorial, which is a key piece of the ideological architecture of uh, the Australian settler narrative, uh, national narrative. The memorial enshrines the memory of Australian World War I soldiers, or Anzacs, who fought on eastern fronts such as Palestine, um, and holds an overwhelming place as uh, a foundational story of national bloodshed that has long overshadowed and displaced the actual violence of frontier colonization within the country itself. Uh, the video, uh, sorry, the artwork included an accompanying video, uh, um, uh, which is featured here in the image, uh, where you see uh, Nuri al okbi a leader of uh, the unrecognized villages in Shalal, which is uh, where the mosaic itself uh, resided, uh, as he explains the invasion and non-recognition of um, uh, Bedouin villages uh, within the Nakab Desert from 1948 and to this day. Um, and so importantly, uh, again within this, comp within this context, um, uh, the Bedouin images are, Bedouin villages, sorry, are not within um, uh, the territorial space of the West Bank, uh, and so in a certain way are not quote unquote proper to a Palestinian national project and yet are part of the displacements uh, and the dispossessions that are, of course, ongoing. Um, so the second part of the exhibition was titled After. Um, and it proposed uh, that if art can have um, perhaps a humble role amid the very grave conditions of politics within its space, perhaps it would be to make connections, to make strange, charismatic, or even oblique connections. In particular, where the map of political struggle appears ever more as an archipelago, Perhaps it is an art of connections that can loosen and unravel an order of things that seeks to govern through a logic of security given as division, confinement, isolation, and a growing industry of border technologies. So the exhibition after was held as a cluster of sites uh, and commenced on the rooftop of uh, the Al Mamel Foundation uh, with uh, Richard Bell's Aboriginal Tent Embassy. So the Tent Embassy was established in 1972 opposite Old Parliament House in Canberra uh, and remains active uh, to this day um, as a very important uh, countrywide network within the sovereignty movement. So what you see within this image is uh, Richard Bell alongside members of the Cutterbing Film Collective seated within the Tent Embassy and with a view across the rooftops of Jerusalem's old city uh, and in which the original signs, such as Aboriginal Embassy or White Invaders You Were Living on Stolen Land, has been translated into Arabic. So nearby, in an old uh, printing press that was forced to close down after annexation in 1967, the Shan Burmese artist Sawang Wangsi Yonghui exhibited a six meter long canvas depicting a scene from his own family history um, when uh, Burmese military gendarmes entered the family house and executed his uncle, spurring the family to uh, join uh, a jungle guerrilla resistance uh, for the Shan people. In fact, his grandmother uh, formed the Shan State Army. So Burmese history itself is also uh, marked by the year 1948, uh, the year in which British colonial occupation withdrew 
uh, delivering um, power into despotic military control, as we know very well at the moment. Um, Yang Hui produced this image following a residency in Jerusalem, and a very unexpected quality was that the local foot traffic often at first glance mistook the image as a Palestinian scene, uh, only realizing it's Shan Burmese narrative upon a closer inspection. And what you see in the image is a man um, who is being uh, surrounded by members of family, who is collapsed, and in the corner, there's a gathering of soldiers. Uh, and that itself is a citation of uh, the Manet painting, The Execution of Mali Maximilian, which itself is a, a famous art historical quotation of Goya's 3rd of May, 1808. Uh, and Yang Hui here is quite deftly pointing to the fractal formations of the violence of the nation state form uh, echoing through European history and, and into uh, his contemporary life of uh, Myanmar, Burma. Um, an artist who took a unique approach to the proposal of after uh, was Christian Niempeter, who cast a film titled The Hereafter, based upon the 1992 uh, film Gwelewa by Senegalese auteur Usman Sembene. Uh, in this film, uh, the setting opens up with the discovery that a man has been buried in the wrong grave. So in the opening scenes, the family and gathered mourners uh, move in disarray among bureaucratic officers attempting to uncover what has gone awry. So Nyampeta's proposal uh, was to shoot a new film in and around present-day Jerusalem that picks up where Gwelawa left off and in which the protagonist awakes to discover that he has arrived in the wrong heaven. So the image here is a mix of footage of the original Gwelawa projected upon Niampeta's protagonist, who was played by a Palestinian Afro-Jerusalemite artist, Bizan Apu Aisha. So um, a last work that I'll mention from the, from the part of the exhibition called After is this film, uh, Wutta, or Saltwater Dreaming, by the indigenous uh, Karabing Film Collective. And in that film, uh, a group uh, of the filmmakers themselves gather around the event of a broken down uh, boat, boat motor, in order to analyze the potential causes of that. Was it angry ancestors? Was it uh, a vengeful uh, Christ? Was it merely rusted wiring and the deprivations of uh, the capitalist uh, predicament? Um, and so thereby in negotiating and analyzing the overlapping regimes of governance uh, faced uh, uh, by indigenous Australians. One of the features of the film is um, uh, the, uh, an analytics uh, which is able to prioritize uh, as well uh, forms of subjecthood, forms of ancestral presence within the land, uh, that are not otherwise recognized within the legal systems of uh, title or even within the formal economic structures of, of, um, uh, of the neoliberal state. Um, and so that is where I really wanted to end in terms of um, the way that Katabing draw to light the struggle for non-recognized forms to be recognized as narratable subjects themselves amid the regimes of the settler colonial legal and national mythos. And it is in the context of such a flattening of narrative complexity that marks the fundamental structure of violence of the settler colonial form that I suggest it is um, crucial in which to view Skolton's highly uh, ambivalent work and dissonant archive. Thank you. In closing, I want to thank all the speakers for their generous and thought-provoking contributions to this program. Furthermore, I want to thank the Public Library of Amsterdam for its continued support towards EDIA. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the EDIA staff who have worked on this project, Claudia Reed in particular. And uh, as this was the closing event of Queer History Month, I want to thank all the partners of Queer Geschiedenis Maand, uh, which is Amsterdam Museum, FOM, ARCOM, Cobra Museum for Modern Art, the Jewish Historical Museum, the Rijksmuseum, and uh, Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam, and the uh, Public Library of Amsterdam. And uh, lastly, I want to thank you, the viewer, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you.